Okay, well, first of all, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you, the Rice House, for having me, for the space, the opportunity. Um, so, my name is Victoria. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, hence the accent. <laughs> so I studied medicine at the university and I've also been practicing yoga since the age of 15. A few years ago I did my training and became a yoga teacher as well and so I wanted to find a way to integrate both medicine and yoga into one more tender and compassive approach to health and disease. So I studied Ayurveda, I still am. It's a long way to go. So in this talk, I will be presenting a few basic concepts about Ayurveda and then a special type of yoga, which has its own, its main focus in breathing. And then at the end, we will have a few more practical examples and guided breathings. Um, I really hope this is kind of dynamic, even though I'm speaking, so you can do any questions. I know you're not here, like going to mute and unmute people, so I'm open to questions at any point. Um, so Ayurveda is considered the oldest healing science. It's about 5,000 years old. And it literally means the science of life, Ayurveda. And it is a system of healing that focuses on the complete person, which includes the body, the mind, and the spirit. Ayurveda defines wellness not as the absence of defined disease, which is nowadays the definition of health by the, the WHO, but more when all the body tissues, organs, systems and functions are acting together in a balanced way and are able to maintain health and wellness. <clears throat> so according to Ayurveda, there are five elements that compose everything and everyone in this universe. These elements are ether, air, fire, water and earth. So it's like the classic four elements, the Western elements, let's say, plus ether, which is kind of like space or a concept where everything happens. Now, we are all made out of these five elements, but some of these elements tend to show more in some people or get off its natural balance more. And this leads us to the next concept, which is the doshas. I don't know if anyone heard of those before. So these five elements um, combine in pairs to form the doshas. The doshas are, it's a very broad concept, but basically these are the forces that create the body. The body, the mind, the way that people act, the way they speak, the way they move. Each human possesses a unique combination of the doshas which defines this person's temperament, physical characteristics, the choices he or she makes through life. And so a balance of the doshas results in health, where imbalance results in disease. So which are these combinations, right? Well, remember the five elements, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, they pair air, and ether pair to form vata. Vata also may mean uh, air, but right now it means vata dosha. And vata, which was the combination of, of ether and air, represents movement and cold. Everything that moves is guided because of vata. Then fire and water pair to form pita like pita bread. Um, so pita represents metabolism, transformation, heat, you know, everything fiery inside the, the body. And uh, water and earth 
pair to form kafa. Kafa means heaviness, tenderness, stability. So I'm going to tell you an animal of an example for each dosha, which is a very beautiful way of understanding uh, like the doshas in nature. For example, vata would be a fast hummingbird. A hummingbird is very mobile, is cheerful. Right now it's here, but at the second, in, in one second, it's here. Uh, that mobile is, is vata. Then pita is a hungry lion. He is a hunter by nature. He's very assertive in what he does. He really knows where to go, where not to go. Orange and hot, can live in a desert. Um, and then kafa is, for example, an elephant. It is loving, it's slow, can travel a long distance at its own pace. Don't you dare hurry them. He will get there, but at his pace. Um, so typically, typically one of these doshas predominates and determinates one's constitution or body type. Then another one plays a more secondary role and this is called bidoshic constitution. This is the most common type of uh, constitution in Ayurvedic medicine. There are some cases which is called tridoshic constitution, but it's um, very, very weird. It is very noticeable because they have like, uh, everything is at peace when you see them. But for most of us, we have a bidoshic uh, constitution. For example, bata-like people tend to be more slender, their hair is thinner, their skin is more dry, they have a variable appetite and they're very curious, fast in mind. The, the um, Ayurvedic like original statement of Bata says that when Bata is in a normal state, he protects the body, brings enthusiasm, exhalation and inhalation. Here the movement is again present. All movements of the body, initiation of the, of the urges, and a proper functioning of the senses. Um, then pita-like, remember pita was fire, uh, also it had water. Um, they tend to be a more moderate frame, red or blonde hair, their skin is more prone to be clear with freckles and moles. They have a strong appetite and strong willpower. They are leaders by nature. And pita in a normal state maintains digestion, body temperature, the vision, the colors, production of thirst and appetite, the complexion, intelligence, and courage. This is all in a normal state. And then kapha. Kapha-like people have much more well-developed muscles and bones. Their hair is thicker and heavier. Their skin is more pale, more smooth, tends to be more cold, and they have a slower metabolism, and that is why they, tain, they tend to gain uh, weight easier. They also have more endurance than, for example, Vata, which is all about mobility. And a balanced Kapha gives stability, lubrication, firmness on the joints, patience, nurturing. Remember the elephant? Okay, that's calf. And okay, so this is like the typical example of each dosha in a normal state or in a, let's say, balanced state. When there is an excess of a dosha, there are clear indicators. For example, with excess vata, remember, movement, air, uh, ether, there can be anxiety, insomnia, constipation, which is related to dryness, and also a more obvious type of dryness, which is uh, skin and hair. With excess pita, which regulated metabolism, transformation, and, and body heat, with excess pita, there are toxins in the blood that give rise to inflammation and infection. Typical excess pita symptoms are a burning sensation in the stomach or reflux, 
um, diarrhea, which is a way the body has of getting rid of excessive heat, um, red eyes, and prema premature baldness also. And also an excess of pizza in the mind can lead to anger and aggressive behavior as well. And with excess kapha, which was, remember, earth and water, there is an increase in, mu in mucus, edema, and tends to have more lung disease. Um, so there's this basic principle in Ayurveda, which is like increases like. So for example, heat, warm weather, spicy food will increase fire and that will show in a pita disorder excess in fire um, for example dryness sour food and a lack of routine will increase air in the person and will show in vata disorder and for example cold cold weather sweet and dairy products will increase kapha <clears throat> There are certain situations in which these doshas tend to imbalance naturally. These are cycles in nature. For example, throughout our life, throughout different ages, we go through different, um, let's say, doshic phases. We first go through a kapha phase, and um, after our adolescence, we enter into a more pitta state or phase. And after the menopause, for example, we enter into a more um, vata phase. That those are like the ages. And then through the year, we go through different uh, doshic phases because of the seasons. For example, we will see our inner fire increased in summertime because warm and dry weather aggravate pitta. On the contrary, during winter, pita feels more comfortable. And the cold doshas, which are vata and kapha, which they don't have fire, so they are more cold, those are the ones we'll have to pay more attention to. And for example, in the autumn, when, when there is more wind and more dryness, we'll have to pay more attention to vata, which is more prone to imbalance. Um, so Ayurveda works as a dance between balance and imbalance, understanding that balance is our natural state and imbalance is, it's, it's nothing to like worry about as, a, as to speak because it's a natural part of life. But there are many ways of approaching health from the Ayurvedic perspective. Food is a very well-known one what do we eat, but it's also important when do we eat it, who do we eat it with, and where did this food come from? Does it come from a space with consciousness that treats, if you eat animals, if, you, if those animals are treated nicely and loving, if you eat only, if, you're, if you have only a plant-based diet, are those plants, uh, what are they watered with, that sort of thing. Um, massages are other, those are very well known in Ayurveda. Um, and there is also a very simple and beautiful, from my point of view, way of working towards balance, which is through breathing techniques. Remember the principle of, of like increases like? Well, the antidote, so to speak, Ayurveda has for this is opposite qualities decrease or, or balance. Um, so by understanding natural habits from the individual, emotional responses and body type, we can adapt our life habits accordingly. Ayurveda treatments are focused on alleviating any doshic excess, meaning illness, uh, with, for example, powerful herbs, and or the, through the improvement of general lifestyle practices such as pranayama, meditation, yoga postures, 
And so we're going to talk a little bit about Ayurveda's approach to health through breathing. As simple as that. You may have heard the word pranayama. I want to talk a little bit about what pranayama is and about swara yoga. I don't know if you ever heard that. So pranayama originally meant to refrain from breathing, to control the breathing as much as to refrain from breathing. According to different authors through history, it also means the complete awareness of one's breath, the expansion of our cosmic energy, and the more modern one is the energy control through breathing exercises. That depends on what each author understands by prana and yama. So this is very important that one special component of pranayama is air retention. There is air retention in pranayama. That is why pranayama is not for everyone because it has... Um, there are some cer certain people who have, for example, glaucoma or hypertension um, or some type of medical history and cannot do air retention. As for swara yoga, which is different from pranayama, swara yoga does not have any retention of air whatsoever during the cycles of breathing. So a lot, like, Almost everyone can do Swara Yoga. It's more safe, it's more controlled, and it's also supposed to be more fluid than Pranayama. And its objective is for us to understand the breath as being the medium of cosmic life force. Pretty simple, huh? So there is an author that says Swara Yoga is an ancient science that correlates the breath with the sun, the moon, and the five elements, helping us to control the moods, heal elements, and be attuned to the cosmic rhythm. Um, so, imbalances in vata, pitta, and kapha can cause diseases, and this can be balanced through swara yoga. That is why we're going to dive into Swara Yoga rather than Pranayama, even though Pranayama has a very uh, well-known name worldwide. It is important to know it's not for everyone and Pranayama should be um, like assigned by doctor if you want, because they are very tailor-made. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that any, that any breathing exercises can cure every disease. That's very important to be, be clear. And please don't stop taking your doctor's pills right away and trade them for Swara Yoga. This is a very beautiful component to add and to try and see what happens. And that, that's a very important thing to, to do, like to start cultivating this perception of, of oneself where like am i feeling good right now during the day during the year am i prone to feel more tired more with more energy am i more attracted to raw foods or cooked foods or do i need more tea do i need more water that sort of thing it's what ayurveda is all about it's about in empowering one's health um, so before we go over to the breathing techniques, are there any questions until now? Everything's okay. Everything is being understood. Anyway, I have the group chat open if anyone wants to, oh, yeah. they can. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So far, it's a great presentation. Thank you. Um, who did you study Ayurveda with? I studied with, uh, it's called Ayurveda Prema, which is the sitting chair for Ayush in Buenos Aires. Ayush is in, you know, the ministry of, um, the, in, in the Western it's called like holistic and integrative medicine, but there is like medicine. 
uh, that's the the main university in India. It has its like house in Argentina. The there is where I studied. Okay, very good. I studied a little bit with Dr. Ladd in New Mexico, but wow. Swara Yoga wasn't so part of your Ayurvedic training included Swara Yoga as a healing method. No. Um, I am also a yoga teacher and I specialized in yin yoga uh, and in swara yoga and meditation. And this presentation is part from formal education and part from going through Ayurvedic experience myself. Um, so if you ask me where did I study Ayurveda from, first myself. Uh, you know, having practiced Ayurvedic lifestyle and then studying it formal at the university and then in this uh, Ayurveda Prema Association. Uh, but yeah. Good. Is Ayurveda becoming a popular method of treatment in South America or Brazil? Uh, no. Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Ah, Argentina. Okay. Yeah. It's, not, it's not very popular method there? It's not. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. I look forward to learning more yoga now. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Well, with that enthusiasm, then we're going to fully dive into um, one breathing exercise for each dosha. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to name them. The names, uh, they're not really that important for you to know. They are important for you to go through the experience and feel the, the breathing exercise. Is it good for me? Is it not good for me? All of that is valid. There is no correct answer because as we said, it's a dance and a game between balance and the imbalance. And this is very personal. So the, the names of the breathing exercises, the first one is called Ujjayi. The second one is called Shitali. And the third one is called Nadi Sodana. And before we go further into these exercises, I would like to suggest to start each one by just thanking, thanking our body and our minds for letting us do this. It's not minor that we are here, we're paying attention, we're listening, we're trying to incorporate things that are good for me, for my environment, for my household. Start with a little gratitude and I think it's a major first uh, step. And now a more technical part. <laughs> the first breathing exercise I would like to propose, it's called Ujjayi, which means uh, victorious breath in Sanskrit. Ah. Nothing to do with my name. <laughs> um, but it's also understood like the breath that will lead us to victory. Um, it is sometimes called the ocean breath and those of you who have practiced it already know why. And so this is a very uh, practical example. So I'm going to guide it, guide you guys through this breathing exercise. And I hope that you can keep it up. I'm going to be uh, very slow. So if someone doesn't have any experience, it's not a problem. Anyway, I also have the chat open if anyone wants to do a question or you can raise your hand. Okay, so the first thing to do is close your eyes if you want to. It's a good way to start bringing your conscious to the present moment, um, to the way we are sitting right now. Am I comfortable? Am I doing just the one task or am I multitasking? Am I being able to focus? Or maybe I'm just in the background. Just, it's not necessary to make any, any judgment, it's just, the proposal is just to observe what's going on in my environment. So then I'm also going to be able to concentrate on myself. 
So how am I sitting right now? Just bringing the attention to my body. Am I comfortable? Do I need to make any adjustments? Just feel your body. And now I want you to get in touch with your own breathing. Where am I breathing from? Is it my chest? Is it my mouth? Is it my belly? Now, now I want you to press your hands slowly towards your stomach, right below your belly button. This is important because Ujjayi is a diaphragmatic breath. So we're gonna breathe through the belly. Thank you so much, my girl. The timing was perfect to get you. Where are you going? Okay, this is a part of life. So instead of judging anything and just printing our opinions, we're just gonna use it to bring, it, bring us more into the present moment. We don't need to be in the mountains of Tibet to be able to meditate. We're just finding our inner peace. And our inner peace has nothing to do with the environment, of course, it can help. But right now, I'm trying to find that little fire inside of me, which is the breath, and by fire, I mean life. So we were bringing the attention to our body. Our face is relaxed. My hands are in my stomach. We're breathing through the belly. Just focus your attention on the belly. Inhalation and exhalation are both done through the nose. Our mouth is just slightly open in a way that we don't add any unnecessary tension, but we are breathing through the nose. Just breathe here. Don't change, don't try to correct anything. We're just paying more and more attention to the contact between your hands and your belly. Feel the warm touch of your hands. My intention is to breathe through my belly. Now with every inhalation, try to push your hands further away with your stomach. And with every exhalation, your hands go deep down towards your spine. With every inhalation, you are inflating a balloon. This balloon gets bigger and bigger, more and more round. With every exhalation, your hands go deep down towards your spine. So what we're going to do whenever we feel comfortable with this belly breathing, is first feel with air, we're gonna feel the lower belly, then rise to the low, lower rib cage, and then finally move into the upper chest and throat. It's a long and deep inhalation. So when we inhale, we inflate the lower belly, the rib cage and the upper chest. And now when we exhale, we gently let all the air out without rushing. Once more, we inhale, lower belly, rib cage, upper chest, and exhale slowly, always through the nose. Just keep doing this and we will add a condiment I want you to slightly restrict the flow of air through your windpipe in order to create a slight constriction in the back of your throat. This action will give your breath an audible quality. I will, I will do it once and then I will go with you so you can keep hearing. It's, it's something like the 
sound of an ocean wave rolling in and out. Some more modern says like the sound of Darth Vader. It is something like this. I hope you heard. I'm gonna do it with more. If it helps, you can imagine as if you had a mirror in front of you that you are trying to fog up, but with your mouth closed would be something like, remember to breathe deeply into your belly Concentrate on the sound of your breath. Allow it to soothe your mind. And begin the next breath before you have the urge to gasp or make a harsh movement with the belly or the throat. Be patient and as time goes by, as inhalation and exhalation goes by, try and relax more and more. In time, with consistent practice, the breath will extend without strain. Um, so Ujjayi ha helps you to stay present, self-aware and grounded, and it also builds internal body heat. All of this helps balance Vata. Remember Vata was the one who was more prone to anxiety, to insomnia, to feeling cold. So if you want to open your eyes or leave them closed, really um, bring back the attention to my voice. And okay, I hope you enjoyed the first of our three breathing techniques. Um, I'm going to keep on going, but if you have any questions, just unmute yourself. I'm here. And okay, so Ujjayi, the, the breathing technique we just did, uh, was sort of like a tool to help balance Bata mostly. Then now the second breathing technique is called shitali. Shitali literally means cooling or refreshing. So which dosha do you think will benefit the most? You're right, pita, fiery pita. Good. Um, this is one of the few breathing techniques in which we inhale through the mouth. This is uh, very unique. And I want to show you a specific pose our tongue is going to do during these exercises. Uh, sorry, this exercise in particular. It's a U shape with the tongue. I'm going to show you. It's like this. So I wanted to, I want you to try and check if you're able to do this U shape with your tongue. Um, those of you who wish to can open their cameras so we can all see the U-shaped, beautiful U-shaped tongues. I'm gonna show it again, it's like this. Um, okay, so now to start, we will rewind just a little bit and sit comfortably in an easy pose, straight spine, neck in line. We're gonna Try and feel our weight pressing down and grounding us, slowing our pace, and feeling the present, the presence at this moment. This moment being, feel the room you are in, perceive the temperature around you. Is there any wind? Is there any breeze? Not to judge, just to observe. Feel the skin and recognize your skin as a bridge between you and the outer world and 
you can leave your eyes open, you can close them. If you are leaving your eyes open, then I recommend a gentle gaze in the eyes, not looking at anything in specific, just the air in front of you. And feel the air traveling into your body, into your lungs, and then out. A few long, soft breaths. Get in touch with your breath. And now whenever you feel comfortable with your breathing, I want you to curl your tongue as I showed a moment ago and inhale through the mouth and exhale through the nose, nose like this. Try again. You, you can imagine as if you are inhaling through a straw, letting the air pass, the cooling air pass. Uh, and don't hold your breath in. Remember, this is not pranayama. Just breathe in, let it flow out, exhale through the nose. You can also ex exhale through the mouth, whatever suits you best. It's little bit better if you exhale through the nose but the important thing is to inhale through the u-shaped uh, tongue i'm gonna show it one more time so if you ever feel hot and bothered burned with anger suffering from hot flashes or just feeling rosy from the summer heat, Shitali, which is the second breathing turning, is a perfect approach. Um, Shitali should be practiced with gentle self-awareness and care. Of course, every approach to a breathing technique or breathing at all should be gentle and loving, but specifically Shitali because Remember, we're aiming for smoothness here. We're trying to balance pitta. The pitta temperament, remember, can be bold and full of courage and a strong leader, which is kind of like the balanced pitta, but can tend to be more competitive and aggressive and impatient when imbalanced. So it's not a competition of who gets uh, cooler, the faster, just at its own pace, try to... It, it's a uh, breathing techniques that refreshes the, the body and the mind, which is also super important. Um, I'm here I see the Margot's question. I'm gonna write them right after we finish with our third one, which is called alternative breathing or Nadi Sadhana for our loving kafas. Our loving kafas can also be too gentle sometimes and maybe need just a little bit of pepper as to speak and to activate and to be more attuned with with the rhythm of the sun this is why it's good to do this uh, nadi sodana which is the third breathing technique it's good to do it in the morning and understand this is not, okay, I do this instead of taking a coffee. It should be um, uh, full of consciousness, okay? And if, if you're feeling this um, kapha imbalance, then it's a very good idea. Nadi Sodana is like the cleaning of the inner body's ch uh, channels. So in Swara Yoga, there are three... Um, breathing systems um, depending on which nostril we are breathing from. The right nostril connects us with our more active and solar side and our left nostril connects us with our more uh, lunar and passive side so to speak and in order to in order to balance 
our kapha dosha, we will want to stimulate our solar side. How are we going to do that? Through our right nostril, our solar nostril. Um, you can see, I don't know if I'm mirrored or not, but uh, by coincidence, my right or solar side is more illuminated and my left one is more lunar, more obscure. So that's a way you can see which is the right and which is the left. Um, I'm going to go over this just a little bit quickly because we're approaching the end of the, of the meeting. But so we will use our hand in a mudra. A mudra is a hand posture called pranamudra. It's like the peace sign. We will have the index and the middle finger uh, standing up. <laughs> And our thumb and ring finger are gonna be more together. My thumb is going to go in my right nostril and my ring finger is going to be over my left nostril. And these two fingers are just going to rest in between my eyebrows. So the purpose of these breathing techniques uh, is to start and finish each cycle of breathing through my right nostril as to have uh, a more solar or active um, energy flowing into me. So I'm going to show it once and I would like for you to uh, follow me. It is a bit of a choreography, but I'm going to explain it step by step and then you can practice it. So we will put our hand in Pranamudra, remember? And then we're going to exhale all the air and collapse our left nostril. So we're going to inhale through the right nostril, collapse with my thumb and open my left nostril. Exhale through my left nostril. Inhale through my left nostril. Collapse and open up my right nostril and exhale. A bit of a mess. We'll go over again. Pranamudra, remember. Exhale all the air we have and inhale through the right. Exhale through the left, inhale through the left, and exhale through the right. So what we did is inhale through the right, exhale through the left, inhale through the left, and exhale through the right. Um, okay, how did you do? Were you able to do it? Um, Something really interesting to do is to check which nostril is more active or open right after we wake up. Um, so I wake up and before I do anything, I take a deep breath in and ask myself, do I sense any difference in between my nostril? Then I can cover one of my nostril and breathe in again exhale and then cover the other and breathe again. Are there any differences? Am I more active today? Am I more passive? More in contact with my solar side, my lunar side? Um, so I think I have talked a lot. <laughs> uh, just I want to know if you have any questions or if you want to ask me personally, I left my email in our group chat. I see that I'm, there are a few questions here and uh, raise hand. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. If we have the time, I can, I'm here. I, time. I just want to say, I thought it was very nice that you gave a breath that corresponded to each of the the doshas, I think that's a great application. 
And um, I just wanted to ask a question about yin yoga. How is it different than other styles of yoga? Um, okay, I will try to answer this broad question in just a moment because I think we have just the time. So yin yoga um, is it's also a mix between traditional Indian yoga with um, Med, with Chinese medicine because through yin yoga you work with the uh, meridians um, it's a way more passive type of yoga you don't build up uh, heat in order to to um, gain flexibility you're not working with muscles you're work, we are working with the connective tissues you may stay for from five to 20 minutes in just one asana. And also the asanas, the postures have different names. Um, and there are a few sequences which work with the stomach, for example, or with the liver. And it's, it's basically, it's a more cold, passive uh, type of yoga. You also stay much more time uh, in, in, in like um, floor postures. You're not standing up, you're not doing any balance or a tree posture. Basically, it's that. Lives up to its name of yin, huh? <laughs> yes, that's why it's called yin yoga, because it's a more passive. But what, what is the part of Chinese medicine that influences the yoga? I have not studied Chinese medicine, but there are a few um, different sequences of yin yoga, which, uh, which yeah, I saw the question. I'm just going to type it right after I, fini I finish answering this question. Um, I think that, uh, is probably gonna be better, best answered by someone who studied Chinese medicine, but it is correlated with the elements which are also different. It also has, for example, metal, it has wood, um, but it works with emotions and uh, yeah, the meridians. Okay, thank you, great. Thank you. It's really, it's really interesting, Victoria, to Hello, may I ask? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. May I ask? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, are you working as a medical doctor in the hospital in Argentina? Uh, right now, I'm not in Argentina. Um, so I, I'm not licensed in the country I am now. I did work as a volunteer paramedic in ambulance. Uh, but but yes, in, in Argentina, yes. So have you got a um, medical doctor's certificate? Uh, a medical doctor's certificate at university before? In university, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started, I started there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, may I ask, and uh, uh, is, is you, do you feel good? At the working as a doctor with Ayurveda knowledge and um, Western medicine. Wow, that's a that very my question, question too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's a very dif difficult feeling, you know. Well, the the idea of Ayurveda is to bring Ayurveda, you know, traditional five thousand years old Ayurveda to the modern type times. So actually, it's very friendly to, to different type of um, medicine or health system. For example, in Argentina, we have a public health system and Ayurveda is often associated with very expensive treatments and sort of uh, elitist. But it's, I think it's our uh, task to make it more known, you know, worldwide, and to know that just something as simple as learning how to breathe with your belly can help 
you know, with a lot of, of treatments. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I don't know if it's hard or not, but at least, at least it's, it's interesting and it's a task for the oh. for ages. Yeah. My last question is, uh, you, do you eat macrobiotically and uh, do you, do you, are you a macrobiotic uh, as well as a doctor? Right. Uh, no, I base my, my diet in mostly plants and cereals and with more, more in harmony, let's say, uh, with, the, with the year. For example, in summer, I tend to eat more of these juices <laughs> uh, or more uh, raw food. And in, in autumn or in uh, winter, I am more prone to hot soups and more spicy foods. Uh, but no, I'm not a micro, um, yeah. Macro. <laughs> Macro <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Victoria, 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 we love you. It's just, it's been a wonderful presentation and we really thank you. I know I'm speaking for all of us here. You've had a great participation and you gave a beautiful presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you no, so please. much. Thank you. We Can hope I... to we hope Can to I see much us? more of you. Yes, please. Thank you. I just have these uh, two small unanswered questions in the group chat. So go um, ahead and you can do that. And we love you. <laughs> Thank you. It was really, really pleasant.